No, I didn't think so. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and thank you very much for coming along to today's um, Senate occasional lecture. My name is Jackie Morrison. I'm the uh, very new Clerk Assistant Procedure in the Department of the Senate, so it's my pleasure to uh, commence proceedings today. Um, we meet today on land where people have met for thousands of years, so I, in welcoming you here, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and their elders past and present. And I'd also like to acknowledge any Indigenous people we might have in the audience today. It really gives me very great pleasure to um, introduce today's lecturer, Dr Anthony Bergen. Uh, Dr Bergen is a senior research fellow at the Australian National University's National Security College and a senior analyst at ASPE, or the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, where he previously served as deputy director. He's published widely on Australia's national security policy and has provided expert advice to parliamentary inquiries into defence, homeland security, and into international policy issues. In 2015, Dr Bergen co-authored with um, Russell Trude, who was then Professor of International Relations and director of the Griffith Asia Institute at Griffith University, and formerly a senator from, from Queensland between 2005 and 2011. And they co-authored a paper that is the subject of today's lecture. And that paper is about the role of parliament in matters of national security. Um, Dr. Rosemary Lang, who I think many of you will be familiar with, uh, the former clerk of the Senate, um, had invited Professor Trude to give a lecture in April of 2016, examining the issues covered by the paper. Sadly, uh, that lecture never took place because Professor Trude became um, very seriously ill and died earlier this year. So today's lecture, delivered by his colleague, Dr Bergen, serves a couple of purposes. One is to look at the issues in the paper, which are as relevant as ever, particularly in light of recent events. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, to mark um, former Senator Russell Trude's contribution, um, both as a senator but also as an academic. Um, I am one of the people who had the pleasure of working with him when he was a senator, and so it, it really does um, touch me to be able to introduce Dr Bergen. Thanks, um, Jackie, and uh, to the Senate for the uh, honour of uh, giving this presentation. And as uh, you've just heard, uh, uh, my good friend Senator Russell Trude uh, was originally asked uh, to, to uh, give the occasional uh, address today, but uh, sadly passed away earlier this year. Um, as you'd know, Russell was the, um, he was a Liberal Senator from Queensland uh, from 2004 to 2010 and Deputy Chair of the Senate uh, Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee. Russell had uh, an incredible respect uh, for the Senate and the uh, uh, parliamentary committee processes. Um, and when he passed, uh, Prime Minister Turnbull uh, said, and I'd quote directly, that Russell uh, had, uh, quote, one of Australia's finest foreign policy minds. And Senator Brandis uh, said after Russell's passing that we're all the better for knowing him. Uh, 
Jackie's right, uh, Russell and I talked about this issue. We wrote some uh, articles uh, and thinking about it together and he's, he's very much in, uh, in my thoughts uh, today. So in, in this uh, talk, I'll offer some suggestions uh, on strengthening and deepening Parliament's engagement with issues of national security and pretty much argue that we shouldn't leave all this to the Prime Minister or the Head of Defence or the Head of the Australian Intelligence uh, Communities uh, to deal with. So the first issue, let me turn to the parliamentary landscape, and I'm not here talking about bollards, and if you came in today, you would have seen uh, the massive uh, new uh, structures being elevated around the parliament. Now, constitutional convention, of course, uh, declares the power to make Australia's national securities firmly in the hands of the executive branch of government. And here today, when I talk of national security, I'm talking about uh, the full range of issues from foreign relations, defence, intelligence, relevant areas of counter-terrorism, border security uh, and so on. Now given this is a Senate uh, occasional lectures, I should note right at the outset that I believe that many of the issues, national security issues this country faces, uh, where the rubber hits the road, if you like, is, is at the state level. I'm thinking here of issues of domestic uh, counter-terrorism, countering violent extremism. I'm thinking of the natural hazards, uh, the natural disasters. Um, if you think about the counter-terrorism space, uh, the, the state police now work closely with ASIO um, and the federal police. Um, the states are obviously uh, vitally important when it comes to protecting our critical uh, national infrastructure. So aside from custom and convention, the dynamics of parliamentary involvement in national security, I think continue to be uh, shaped by four uh, powerful realities of Australian life. First, the Prime Minister's authority in relation to national security, I think, continues to grow. This may or may not be desirable in terms of managing a coherent national security policy or for acting quickly, but I think it does potentially risk sucking the oxygen out of an open policy process, limiting other parliamentary voices and on occasions other ministerial voices. When the opposition leader is uh, briefed um, by the Prime Minister on national security issues, it often brings that occupant into a kind of cone of silence. Now, while it is sensible, of course it's sensible to have continuity when it comes to national security policy, pushing too hard here to get a national consensus can act to inhibit debate and critical thinking, and it can reduce accountability. Bipartisanship can inhibit parliament from scrutinising operational matters with vigour, or for parliament using the full breadth of parliament's uh, powers to compel information from the executive. Second, all political parties, of course, now increasingly seek to achieve and enforce party discipline. While that has an undoubted logic in the modern Westminster system, if it's overused or applied too strongly, it does constrain members and senators' uh, independence of action. It weakens the ability of the opposition and the backbench parliamentarians to hold the executive accountable in national security. Third, members and senators are less likely to have a background in international relations, defence uh, or, or domestic security than to have a background in law, education or increasingly, as we know, in politics itself. Those parliamentarians with an interest or expertise in national security may exercise greater influence than their colleagues. So parliamentary oversight in a funny kind of way may actually now depend on the strength of such individuals. Fourth, and despite what I said uh, about Australian politicians generally treating national security in a bipartisan fashion, the modern parliamentary ritual does tend towards political point scoring, and that does make it more difficult, I think, for, uh, to analyse complicated national security issues with the vigour that they do deserve. So despite these trends, parliamentary processes and procedures do offer many opportunities to ventilate national security issues and theoretically um, to strengthen the ability of backbenchers who want to develop an interest in national security policy. I'd now, uh, Jackie, like to turn uh, directly to a bit more controversial topic and that's the subject of parliament and war powers. In recent years, there's been increasing calls by civic uh, action groups and some representatives from the minor parties for greater parliamentary uh, scrutiny over the executive's long-held prerogative to deploy Australian mil military forces overseas. 
I think you'd all be aware that the UK uh, in, in, since 2011 has moved to a system in which Parliament must be involved in any decision now to go to war. In 2013, the House of Commons debated a government motion that the UK um, join US-led strikes in Syria. The motion was defeated and the Prime Minister uh, then, Cameron, responded by saying that he would respect that vote. But in my view, governments need the capacity to act quickly to events. Involving Parliament to, could hamper its ability to do so, and I think involve a, a very heavy additional burden on decision making. The unique knowledge of complex foreign affairs issues, the need to access intelligence required for informed decision making do pose additional challenges to greater parliamentary involvement. Governments are elected, surprise, surprise, to govern, and there's no greater responsibility of them than to protect the national interests. Central, in my view, to this task is the onerous need to decide when military forces should be deployed. Australians expect their governments to make difficult policy choices. In simple terms, in very basic terms, it's all about democratic uh, legitimacy, allowing a government to govern unless parliament no longer has, of course, confidence in that government. But some contend that going to war now is far too important to be left solely to the prime minister. Instead, parliamentarians should have the right, as I say, to vote on military action and should have an obligation to explain their position. Now, the most recent exposition of this argument I heard uh, was Senator uh, Nick Xenophon, uh, who made exactly this argument quite recently to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. He had, by the way, a fantastic title for his talk, quote, on killing chickens and scaring monkeys, unquote. Best title I've heard. Um, Senator Xenophon argued in favour of war powers reform against a backdrop of changing uh, regional strategic environment and a potential confrontation between the US and, and China in the South China Sea. The senator stated absolutely plainly that he didn't think Australia should participate in any conflict in the South China Sea until every member of the Australian parliament had an, an opportunity to vote on it. So from this idea, I think a number of questions flow. For the entire parliament to give an informed vote, it stands to reason that they'd require more information to, than to do so. Given most of them vote along party lines, then there's an argument that it would be better to go straight to the party executive and do a deal. But in general, it would mean extending the inner circle, privy to such sensitive information, to include each and every parliamentarian. Now look, it's not a showstopper that members of our defence and intelligence uh, community would resist this idea. I simply note, note that point. More importantly, however, I think there's a challenge of determining exactly what so sort of government decision should trigger parliamentary action. Is it any deployment of the Australian Defence Force, a commitment for a certain period, a certain force structure? Could a UN Security Council decision constitute um, an exemption? Would a commitment, for example, to peacekeeping trigger the need for a vote? In a complicated world, the occasions and circumstances in which force in its various manifestations is becoming uh, more difficult to describe and define. Having Parliament, I believe, involved in every term would impose an additional burden of decision making in relation to issues that are in fact already amongst the most difficult issues government makes and the most carefully considered, I'd add. Now, a parliamentary authorisation model could perhaps be framed to address some of the concerns that I've just uh, set out. Senator Xenophon, for example, he advocated a model that dis distinguishes what he called wars of choice and wars of necessity. He argued that this provides the necessary flexibility to take into account a whole range of contingency. It would protect classified information and provide the time sensitive nature of, of security emergencies. Wars of necessity uh, are defined, and I'm quoting the Senate, military actions taken in self-defence and require the use of rapid and or covert military force. In other words, actions provided under F Article 51 of the UN Charter. Conversely, wars of choice are those covered by the framework of collective action in Chapter 7 of the UN Charter or a request for assistance from a legitimately constituted government of a state. 
But here, ladies and gentlemen, I'd agree with uh, my colleague uh, at, at uh, Aspie, Rod Lyon, who argued that this distinction between wars of necessity and wars of choice isn't, in fact, that useful. By allying ourselves with other countries, allying ourselves with other countries, aren't we, Rod asks, in effect, effectively saying that we accept an element of automaticity in our involvement in conflicts when they're attacked? It sounds, more, it sounds a little odd to subsequently claim um, that we take all such treaties as denoting mere wars of choice. If we thought that way, why, why did we sign the treaty in the first place? I think Dr Lyon is also right in questioning the ideas of wars of necessity are wars of self-defence. If you think about the Second World War, for example, even before our home front was attacked, we confronted uh, a group of adversaries who fundamentally wanted to reshape the world. Even if they hadn't attacked Australia, it's, I think, right to question how we could have actually sat that one out. Bottom line, strategic necessity doesn't end at the low watermark. I think there are some other issues to consider here. Passing legislation to grant um, uh, parliamentary control over expeditionary military deployments may invite the judiciary to review the legality of these decisions. In my view, we should be very wary of involving judges in what are essentially political decisions. Senator Xenophon rightly acknowledges that there's a degree of flexibility in executive power necessary for unforeseeable circumstances. Indeed, our constitution, our high court jurisprudence substantiate that the executive power is subject to control by the legislative branch of government. But just because something can be done doesn't mean it should be or that's the right thing to do. For, furthermore, where the government of the day doesn't control the Senate, which is, let's be honest, the new normal in Australian politics, it would just add confusion and ambiguity to overseas deployments uh, decisions to give Parliament a vote. Under these circumstances, parliamentarians would be able to prevent the executive from, setting, from sending armed forces on operation with no immediate consequences to themselves. It would be all check with no balance. Now, I suppose a one-chamber vote a one chamber vote might be workable if a decision to deploy uh, troop deployments were thought necessary. But then in effect, we already have that with the House of Representatives, where members uh, uh, can, uh, of the majority party, can change a leader if they oppose a war strongly enough. Difficult, I concur, but uh, it's still possible. Even by the way, as an aside, um, if we introduced a parliamentary vote to go to war, I think it'd be unlikely to make any practical difference to the actual outcome. I can't think of a single example where it would have changed the decision on Australia's commitment to send our troops to war. So in my view, we should preserve the existing relationship between parliament and cabinet when it comes to decisions about overseas military deployments. That said, however, when with an extension of war powers maybe a bridge too far, Parliament's role could be considerably expanded in this area. Government might take the Parliament into its confidence much more, for example, by providing st regular statements to Parliament on the basis of decisions and reporting more regularly on the progress of military operations. The Defence Subcommittee, for example, or the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence and Trade could have a look at, at, at this whole issue, uh, issue of extending some measure of authority to Parliament over the overseas deployment of the ADF. Now, Jackie, I'd like to offer four measures uh, to strengthen Parliament's role in national security. First, Parliament should be respected as the forum for considering national security issues. I think existing parliamentary procedures can be better utilised to consider and debate foreign affairs, defence, intelligence and border security more fully. For many years, governments have, I think, seemed inclined to bypass parliament with security, dealing with security issues. That's regrettable. Uh, I think it's been a function of the rapid changes in the way parliament engages with the media and a view by government for, that dealing with the, the micro parties, they can't, they, there's a feeling they can't be educated to contribute anything meaningful. That it's better to have conversations perhaps behind the scenes with the minor parties. But let's be honest, I think it has suited, uh, simply suited the political imperatives of successive governments, not necessarily the cause of good public policy. So I think Australian governments should commit themselves to ensuring the Australian parliament is the primary national institution for discussing 
and debating the, the uh, country's national security policy. They should ensure that Parliament is a forum for pronouncements on all key national security policy decisions, and it's provided with regular opportunities to discuss, consider and debate policy issues. I believe it's regrettable that in recent years we've seen defence white papers being launched uh, at uh, military bases, uh, in aircraft hangars, naval bases, and just last month we saw the Defence Minister uh, announce uh, an increase in Australian troops deployment in Afghanistan, not in the Parliament, but uh, during a response during uh, Senate, Senate estimates. Contrast that with what we saw just a couple of weeks ago in the Canadian Parliament, where the Canadian Foreign Minister set out a co comprehensive new foreign policy for, for Canada. Wasn't announced at a mega conference, it wasn't uh, announced uh, at some diplomatic meeting, but it was announced right, right on the floor of the Canadian Parliament. Second, we should develop parliamentarian, parliamentarians' education in national security. In these challenging and uncertain times, good national security policy choices calls for parliamentarians who have been sufficiently educated and informed on national security. This could, for example, in pro provide, include providing members uh, or orientation programs um, focused on national security, an enhanced program of uh, regularly informed briefings by senior Australian public servants, site inspections of specific national security agencies, the creation of a cross-party parliamentary friend friendship group could, could, uh, could be dedicated to improving knowledge and understanding of our national security policy by regular briefings and so forth. Third, we should, in my view, develop what I call parliamentary diplomacy. Although many senators and MPs regularly engage with foreign government officials and parliamentarians through various mechanisms, like parliamentary friendship groups, overall our parliamentarians, I think, are a rather underutilised resource um, when it comes particularly to international policy, foreign relations. At a time when Australia's national, uh, our overseas diplomatic footprint ranks 20th in the, out of 35 OECD countries and 18th in the G20, surely there's room for some creative thinking to identify opportunities to make better use of interested and able parliamentarians to enhance our international policy. One useful measure would be to expand the structured and focused outgoing parliamentary delegations program. No doubt they'd have to be, bear the brunt of the tabloids so having a crack uh, about the expenditure of uh, parliamentarians on overseas jollies, no doubt. In conjunction with the re relevant parliamentary committees, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and her department could consider ways in which members and senators um, could make useful contributions to the conduct of Australia's international diplomacy, such as parliamentary participation in international negotiations, uh, attending diplomatic conferences and so forth. Look, I can almost hear you say, yep, but don't all our representatives think they're really smart uh, and they want a high, pro high profile? Uh, so what I'm, just, what I'm suggesting simply just risks uh, diverting valuable resources from government uh, or almost creating fake programs uh, uh, where the less knowledgeable uh, members and, and senators uh, can't do any real damage. My response, I suppose, to that line of uh, rejection or uh, objection is, look, um, we need to manage those sort of risks and, and, and none of us really have all the answers. Second, uh, fourthly, I would suggest that we review parliamentary uh, committee resources, uh, look at the pen potential impact of committee reports and examine committee mandates. Um, <sighs> The parliamentary committee system is impacted by the general bipartisan agreement on the overall thrust of national security policy. Now, while that does make it easier to pass legislation and it's a better look for international uh, negotiations, I think it does mean that the two major parties don't press for the committees to have access to sensitive information. Moreover, this bipartisanship, I think, does sometimes um, tend to mean that larger policy questions aren't debated, leaving some of the committees to look at less marginal areas uh, of disagreement. It'll be interesting to have a look at the outcome of an uh, inquiry that's just been set up in the last two weeks um, uh, by the, um, the Defence Subcommittee of the Joint uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence and Trade that's explicitly um, going to look at whether we should have consensus, bipartisan consensus, uh, on defence planning and, indeed, if it's desirable, uh, that, that, that we should. Um, as far as the committees themselves are concerned, more generally, I think a material improvement in, in uh, 
uh, and national security issues uh, uh, is warranted in terms of an increased financial and human resources to the committees. Over the years, the resources um, allocated to the functions of parliament have steadily eroded steadily, and that has had an impact uh, on, the, on the length of committee inquiries, the employment of staff, the ability to have witnesses attend hearings and, and so forth. Um, the chairs of the key national security committees, um, I think, um, could take much more advantage of secondments uh, from members of the National Security uh, Committee to join the staff of the relevant uh, secretariats. That would increase the committee's uh, human resources and build staff expertise, but of course it would also help the secondees' knowledge uh, from the security agencies of the workings of parliament uh, and the role it plays in the administration and oversight of national security policy. Um, I think parliamentary reports themselves in the areas of foreign, foreign affairs and national security aren't, sadly, always given the attention within government agencies that they deserve. Uh, as Professor Julius Sumner Miller once said, why is it so? Uh, I think the answer really relates to the committee reports, how they're structured and presented. Um, you know, I'm used to looking at reports from think tanks and, uh, and uh, private sector uh, uh, consulting agencies, and um, I think, by contrast, the way parliamentary committee reports are presented um, doesn't necessarily grab busy people's attention. So I think we can, we can look at uh, that a bit more. Um, one quote that I found in preparing uh, the talk today on, on committees was uh, by Sabana Cox, former clerk of the House of Commons. He, he once observed, quote, a committee is a cul-de-sac down which ideas are lured and then frequently strangled. Um, let me just then turn briefly um, to look at some of the committees. Firstly, the committee um, on treaties, the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. I think it has struggled with the fact that international instruments do arrive on its agenda only after they've been negotiated by government and often after a very lengthy process. I think the committee uh, members would be better placed to offer comment and review at an earlier stage when there's still an opportunity to make a valuable contribution. We have the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade, and we have the Senate with a wide remit, and the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee um, that assumes a lot of the burden of investigation in the areas I'm talking about today. I think, uh, I'm not an historian of the parliament, I couldn't find why we have two committees with very, very close uh, overlapping remits. I suspect the reason's historical, and like the Constitution, not easy to change, but maybe, maybe, uh, it would be worth having a fresh look at that issue. Um, so over time um, on committee reports, I think the joint committee for inquiries have resulted in influential reports that have been valued by, by successive governments. That is especially the case, I think, when the, the, the committee reports are unanimous, that they address an issue that ministers are not, are, are not confident about or where they may be concerned about the objectivity of their advising departments or when the committee offers a novel take on a controversial or neglected issue. Um, I'd also note here that uh, a lot of committee reports in national security, um, the, the influence of those reports is in fact felt many years later because they do shape the marketplace of ideas, if you like, rather than exercising direct influence over policy at a given time. Now, I couldn't find, uh, I couldn't find uh, any study of the impact of uh, committee reports uh, on government policy. So, Jackie, I suggest maybe uh, we get a... a we refer that issue to one of the committees itself. Um, I think the need for inquiries to be approved by the appropriate minister or by resolution of one of the Houses of Parliament is, I think, a constraint on the committee's independence. It is really, in my view, um, a vestige of a bygone era uh, that compromises the committee's capacity to make a potentially valuable contribution to policy debates. It should be bluntly removed. Committees should have the power to self-refer and initiate their own inquiries outside their powers to consider matters arising from annual reports of, of the relevant agencies. Of course, either House can give a referral. That's more common by the Senate. Uh, 
And yes, it's true that a committee can approach a minister to get a reference, but if the, if the committee members did think that the minister wouldn't, wouldn't support that request, they're pretty unlikely, in my view, to ask for it. Um, I think the committee's public education role would be enhanced if the, in, in practice the minister's appearances before uh, committees for private briefings were extended to public briefings on matters of contemporary importance like uh, events in Afghanistan or the Middle East. Let me just say something um, for five minutes uh, on the Joint Committee because it's perhaps the most controversial here, the Joint Committee on Intelligence Security. It's probably been one of the busiest parliamentary committees in recent years since September 2014 uh, when our national terror alert level was raised to probable. There's been eight legislative packages uh, progress through the federal parliament. Now the Intelligence Services Act 2001 mandates a composition of this joint committee comprise six members of the House of Reps and five senators. It's currently required to have a, a um, membership of the majority of government members, so consequently its findings do align with the government of the day. This is the committee that the government immediately refers counter-terrorism legislation to, and I believe it's served as a, as a check and balance really well. Sometimes one might argue too well. Um, in the sense that sometimes it doesn't always serve immediate security needs. It's taken a couple of years in some, some cases, such as the legislation lowering the, the, the age of control orders, between the legislative update requested for operational needs and the actual approval. That's not always helpful, obviously, for people on the ground. I think it's fair to say, however, that approvals have been sp speeded up when the, the committee knows more and has more experience with the topics. In other words, once people have been in a committee for a while, they have the history and the context and the perspective uh, to make quicker decisions and understand issues. Um, when law enforcement uh, and security agencies do recommend changes, these are obviously carefully asked for based on, on what, they, what they need. But one of the side effects, and I do say it's a side effect uh, of the committee's work, is that you can get a watered down version of the legislation. The result is that sometimes agencies have been cautious in proposing new laws as they know they'll lose something as a result, even on pre-existing and therefore previously approved laws. Sometimes the agencies have to justify the need for a law to be ongoing, such as the control order laws uh, around keeping people in detention. Once passed, the agencies then still have to go back each year uh, and redefend the need for it. The committee may decide, may decide the need or the urgency is no longer there. But shortly down the track, circumstances may well change and, and, and make the law vital. Again, that's a tough uh, challenge for the law enforcement and security agencies. But I wouldn't want you to think that I'm not uh, supportive of the committee's work. I think uh, there's no doubt uh, that they've done a very good job uh, when uh, considering terrorism legislation, and that's best done um, carefully and, and, and methodically. I think one way to institute an additional check would be to have all the six intelligence agencies before, the, before Senate estimates. As you know, uh, it's only the Office of National Assessment and ASIO that do so. Um, only one of the six intelligence agencies, ASIO, is required to produce an annual report to the parliament and any sensitive or operational parts of that report are redacted. I'd suggest all six intelligence agencies should produce an annual report to the parliament. Now, I want to spend a minute on a development that's occurred in the UK when it comes to intelligence oversight. The, the committee in Britain that uh, mirrors uh, our joint committee on intelligence and security um, has not so long ago was given the power to um, conduct, uh, to look at intelligence operations. operations. Um, now, I think that uh, suggestion that um, our committee look not just at whether an action is lawful, but whether uh, an operation has been effective, does raise some curly questions. For example, who would scrutinise an operation if our parliamentarians were themselves involved? Such a change would also, in my view, mean overturning the historical practice of not applying to members and senators the same checks and balances applied to public servants and as a, instead subject to the parliamentarians to a security clearance regime. What would happen, for example, if one of our parliamentarians failed 
to be security cleared. I should add here that the Joint Committee is the only one where the Intelligence and Security, where the, where the Prime Minister does have to approve all members of the committee, and that's set out in the Intelligence Services Act. Now, while some might argue that those excluded through this process would be unable to represent voters adequately, and that this move would therefore challenge our democratic system, I'd argue that it doesn't. It simply excludes those people without a clearance from accessing information that's sensitive. And that this rule, given that it would be applied to all members of that committee, is surely democratic. I'd argue also, or point to the fact that the similar committees in the US and the UK uh, members uh, do require security clearances. And by the way, the, the, the staff that the work on the intelligence secretariat for that committee themselves have to be security vetted to the highest level. I'd also add, of course, uh, the greater number of people who are given access to sensitive information and intelligence, the higher the, the chance of leaks and compromised operations. Um, there's another consideration that I touched upon earlier, and that is processes and approvals within the Intelligence and Security Committee uh, are sped up when its members are more educated and experienced, both respect to the issues at hand and the functions of the committee itself. Um, I'd also add as an aside um, that uh, the Inspector General of Security and Intelligence, while not based in the Parliament, is absolutely a critical uh, position in our system. The Inspector General has uh, unfettered uh, access to all information on operations, including classified information. And while the IG doesn't report to the public, uh, and this may give a perception perhaps of less oversight, the IG does report to the government. Now, the, the, the Senate estimates processes themselves is really, I think, now become the locus of accountability within the parliamentary system. For all its faults, and it has many, for all its faults, it, uh, and, you know, they have become in, in, on some occasions quite politicised. I think estimates hearings um, do provide uh, the opportunity for senators to, uh, opportunity for vigorous questioning of, of executive uh, officials and officers. The fact really that, the sen that any senator can ask questions and that the estimates process happens uh, three times a year for two days of 18 hours, I think it's impressive. It's an incredible accountability mechanism. I should also add here there's the role of the smaller parties uh, to shape the senator's reference uh, committee. It allows the smaller parties to use their votes uh, in the Senate to secure port reports in, in the references committee. Uh, and that can be a pertinent, very pertinent in the defence realm. And just the other day, the Greens were able to get a reference uh, to examining the national security implications of climate change up. So I think, again, compared to other countries, Canada, New Zealand, it's, 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 it's a good mechanism. Um, let me conclude, Jackie, so we can uh, take some questions. The role of Parliament as a forum for discussion, discussing national security, investigating new and significant policy, policy challenges and overseeing executive authority, particularly in relation to in intelligence activities, has grown significantly. That growth has been steady, but also rather piecemeal um, as well. If anything, the process has been evolutionary as Parliament has rather carefully and cautiously tested its ability to press boundaries of its role, sometimes against the strong resistance from ministers. But I think reform has changed the institutional culture of Parliament. It's legitimised Parliament's role as an increasingly important uh, partner of the executive in the conduct of our national security policy. There's undoubtedly room uh, for further expansion of this role, uh, as, as I've uh, dis discussed today. Enhancing Parliament's role in national security would, I believe, reinforce the executive accountability. It would expand public uh, access to policy process, improve the quality of our public debate on, uh, on these national security issues, and strengthen our democratic foundations. Our parliamentarians should, in my view, move the needle in the direction of change to improve and strengthen the management of our national security policy in an age of growing complexity and challenge. Thank you. Well, we've um, done very well on time indeed, so we have got a bit of time for questions.
Um, did you want to have a seat? No, no. You, you stand still. Um, oh, and we have one straight off the bat. So. Thank you for a most interesting address. I was very intrigued by your proposition that decisions to go to war are most carefully considered. I think I got your proposition right. I've tried to write it down. And I'd like to test that against the decision to invade Iraq in 2003. Mm -hmm. We've had an inquiry into intelligence, the flood inquiry, which established a lot of intelligence failures. But we haven't had an inquiry into the decision-making process, uh, nothing like the Chilcot inquiry in uh, the UK. But I think it's widely understood that when the archives are eventually thrown open and academics feverishly look for cabinet submissions, policy papers and so on, they will actually find nothing that seems to be the general understanding. So I'd be interested in your comment that the decision was very carefully considered. And secondly, you referred to the UK current practice, uh, Prime Minister Cameron's respect for the uh, resolution of the House of Commons in relation to Syria. It's my understanding that most European countries also have provisions requiring parliamentary approval uh, for going to war. I think Ireland, France, Austria, Sweden, the Netherlands uh, do require parliamentary approval. Have they all got it wrong or why should Australia be so different? Thank you. Look, on the um, decision making uh, around uh, the commitment to, to go to war in Iraq, um, if, if uh, your, your call for, we, we haven't had in Australia a formal Kilcott uh, type inquiry, that's, that's, that's absolutely uh, true. And um, I think um, until we actually know, which is I think your point, uh, until we actually know the uh, processes of decision making uh, conducted in such a way, we won't be able to, 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 to come up with a formal judgment about whether all the different arguments uh, were considered. Um, so I, I personally think, and I supported uh, the war decision at the time, um, in the light of further information, um, I think um, <laughs> I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have uh, supported it. Um, but I think what you're saying is uh, until we actually conduct a, uh, uh, a comprehensive examination of, of the whole way in which uh, that, was, uh, that, that decision was conducted, um, I think uh, it's difficult to say that all aspects of and uh, all the circumstances and the way it evolved were factored into the decision making. Um, I, I, on the point that you've raised about uh, overseas examples of uh, where Parliament gets the vote uh, or, or gets some involvement, um, I, I'm not saying that other countries, uh, and obviously the United States uh, is, is very uh, important here as well in terms of their model. All I'm saying is for the, in the context of the Australian case, and you said are, are all the others uh, uh, wrong. Uh, I think you have to look at the circumstances of, of each particular country and, and as I say, I think, I'm not going to repeat all the arguments I set out at length in that talk, but um, I think it is a bridge too far, but um, I think it was, uh, the parliament can do more. For example, I thought it was, um, it was uh, it's quite uh, stunning that Australia did not have a debate on Afghanistan until 2010 in the parliament. Amazing, really, when you think about the, the length of time we were involved in that war before there was any parliamentary discussion. So I think, again, without setting all the, the suggestions in the talk, parliament can certainly uh, play a much greater role. Um, I find it disappointing, for example, that the parliament has spent much more time looking uh, at uh, the politics of commemorating wars a hundred years ago than you know our involvement in in, uh, in in actual wars right now. So, absolutely concur with you, sir. That we should be doing more. Um, but let's look at the Australian case rather than this saying, well, because they do it overseas, we've got to follow them. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thanks very much for your talk, Dr. Bergen. Um, I just mentioned I'm Sue Wareham from Australians for War Powers Reform. 
And uh, our group grew out of the experience of 2003 where a decision to take Australia to war was made by virtually one person, Howard. Um, it was a catastrophic decision which a lot of people were, were saying at the time. So from that experience, uh, we uh, regard that our system is, is broken. Our system of going to war is broken and it needs radical change. Uh, and our group advocates uh, a parliamentary uh, vote. Um, I've actually got three points, if you don't mind. Um, you argued against um, the idea of both houses having to vote before uh, deployment to international armed conflict, but um, and one of the one of the arguments that's put forward is that this could um, prevent the country from going to war when uh, when it's actually required. But if, if that were the only situation which that could occur would be if the government could not convince the opposition that we need to go to war. Now, if the government cannot, if the opposition is not convinced that there's a good case for war, then one could say there's probably not a good case for war. Um, so perhaps a, a comment uh, on, on that particular aspect. Um, you mentioned also that um, a need for a vote in both Houses of Parliament could delay a deployment uh, when we in fact need speed. Um, but one of the points made by uh, President of Australian Sport House Reform, Paul Barrett, is that our forces are generally not, except for a small number, are generally not kept in a high state of readiness. And there is always delay in, in any event, and he actually does not, not buy into that argument. Um, but the, and the third thing uh, I'd ask you to comment on, I, and perhaps I misunderstood, but I thought you were in referring to ANZUS uh, talking about um, the fact that Australia uh, goes to war every time the United States goes to war. And I wasn't certain if you were saying that and the ANZUS Treaty compels, compels it to be that way. Um, but Many people would argue that, um, I think quite rightly, that ANS the ANSYS Treaty is, does not actually say that Australia needs to go to war whenever the US does. Um, and the fact that we do, many people in this country see is a big, big problem, that there doesn't seem to be a distinction between US interests and Australian interests, if the US in fact even know what's, what is in their own good interests most of the time. So uh, thank you. Sorry for that handful of stuff. But Okay. Um, there are a number of uh, questions, Sue, that you've, you've uh, posed there. Um, on the role of the opposition, um, I think the point that I was making was that if you include the entire parliament, um, you're also, I assume, uh, I've assumed by looking at what people are arguing, that they're also talking about the Senate. Um, and of course, as I said in my talk, the new normal in Australian politics is that there, we are going to have micro parties represented uh, on, a, on a continuing basis, I think, in the Senate. So um, it's definitely not just the role uh, of the opposition. True. That's now, but who, who knows how, how, how things were, would evolve. Uh, on your point about um, readiness of, uh, and uh, the need that I said that certain circumstances may demand uh, quick decisions, uh, well, um, I, I'm not sure whether Mr Barrett would actually have access to the readiness levels of the ADF for a start, but uh, I think my point is that there are circumstances where governments do need to, to make decisions um, you know, in a timely manner and that uh, locking that into the whole of, of, par of parliamentary debates and procedures I think uh, potentially uh, could, could serve not to advance uh, uh, the, national, the national interest. And, and, and look, the other point I'd make, Sue, is that it's not clear whenever I've seen these arguments about war powers for the parliament, what exactly, and I'm just repeating what I put out in my talk, what exactly are the factual circumstances? For example, would, would our deployment to Timor, would that have required uh, a parliamentary vote, even though originally it was a, a stabilisation mission? So the circumstances and the, the factual circumstances of where and, and how our military are deployed now are very varied. It's not just a a straight case of, of uh, 
uh, of, and I, I think I discussed Senator Xenophon's distinction about wars of choice and wars of necessity. I don't think it's that simple. Look, the point, the, the final question, Sue, you asked me about uh, uh, ANZUS. I think all I was saying there, uh, well, the answer to your question is no, of course, we're not automatically obliged um, to um, go to the assistance of the US under any circumstances uh, involving conflict. Uh, of course not. But I suppose the point I was making is countries don't enter into treaties unless they that do require some for, form of collective self-defence, unless they think that they will act on it. Now, you're right, <laughs> it's not automatic, it's, it's up to the individual country, but you don't enter into those sort of treaties unless you're prepared to very seriously consider uh, the option of, of, of joining a conflict. Mm. Um, I might just check the gentleman in the gallery, I think, has been waiting patiently. Sorry, so we'll come back down to you. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I was wondering if there was a, a in-between option instead of going from the Prime Minister approving going to war and the Parliament, that there could be an option of you just say, well, it's a vote done by the Cabinet. But I also understand that there's a body within the government, the National Intelligence Security Council, that includes the Attorney General, the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Prime Minister. There's things a group of about eight or ten people who all get regular top secret security briefings and updates on situations that there could be a, a body within the cabinet or within the the government that is very well informed and considered on the matters that meets to make a vote as opposed to putting it to the whole parliament. Thanks. Well, if I may say so, sir, that is what happens now. The, the National Security Committee of the cabinet is set out in the way you've just uh, presented it already, uh, is involved in those executive decision makings about deployments. Or, or am I missing, missing your point? Well, my hmm. understanding is that Bob Hawke committed us to war uh, in the first Gulf War without calling the cabinet together and consulting them. And that um, the previous, one of the previous questions said in effect that the decision to go to war rested purely with John Howard. So my reading of the situation was that that doesn't necessarily happen and it could be changed that it is required that it does happen. Well, I think, I think it would be uh, almost um, unheard of if, if a Prime Minister weren't to try and leverage the National Security Committee of Cabinet in a decision about um, troop deployments. I, 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 so I hear what you're saying. Well, why don't, why don't balance, you make uh, that as a recommendation? I, I suppose my response is uh, it, it happens as a matter of uh, course. And I take your example of Bob Hawke. I don't know in the Gulf War whether whether he uh, actually uh, drew in the cabinet. I'd be surprised if he didn't talk to the foreign and defence minister uh, at the time. But um, anyway, I, I think my response is to your question is that I, I believe as a, as a formality, National Security Committee of Cabinet would be convened uh, to, to, to consider those sort of uh, executive decisions. Mm. I think if we, if we have quick questions, we can probably do two more. So perhaps the lady at the front first. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, Dr Bergen. Um, I'd concur with the uh, points made by the first um, speaker over here that there was such opposition to the war in uh, Iraq and also Afghanistan that not having a parliamentary vote really, I think, degrades the respect for um, parliament when they make a decision that goes against, I think, probably the majority of the population at the time. And the effects, as you have recognised, have been disastrous. So I guess it's just a comment. But a question, uh, I agree with your point that the bipartisanship um, in Australian politics on national security issues doesn't uh, really uh, lend itself to having a good discussion on these issues. So mm. I'm just, you know, like, uh, if you'd like to just expand on why that is the case. Why do we have such bipartisanship? I mean, I think there's some obvious answers, but I'd like to hear your view. Thank you for that question. Um, I think the answer, and you're asking is why the, there is a, an emphasis on bipartisanship. I think the answer is because parliamentarians believe that if they're seen to be rocking the boat on a security issue, they're seen somehow as disloyal. That 
you know, public safety is far too important to be left to, to um, politics. Um, so, you know, and, and um, I've noticed, for example, when parliamentarians have, have come out with a different view, uh, let's say on South China Sea policy, they're often criticised by, um, you know, the media saying, well, you're taking a different view on this from your party. So um, I think the emphasis on trying to seek um, consensus um, has had a, a retrograde uh, measure. As I say, on the one hand, it's good that you have policy continuity, but I think if, there's, if, there, if the senators and, and members are drawn too much into an artificially constructed consensus in national security, it actually doesn't help advance public debate. Um, and um, um, look, you know, you would think, it, it, it's, it's in a funny kind of way, it's telling parliamentarians to do what they're supposed to do, argue, debate, discuss and so forth. Um, so it is curious, um, as I say, uh, you know, we, we've spent more time in the parliament discussing issues to do with commemorating battles 100 years ago than we have um, some of our current conflicts. And uh, so I think I'd, I'd like to move, which is implicit in your question, I'd like the, move to the parliament uh, not to throw away bipartisanship, on, but, but certainly to uh, be much more willing to test uh, and, and argue when it comes to national security. I think that's only healthy. And I think it is an unfortunate trend, as your question implies, that uh, parliamentarians um, have feel constrained not to be seen or to, as rocking the boat or disloyal to the, to, to the national interest if they're, if they're seen as questioning you know, defence policy settings or counter-terrorism settings and so forth. I think debate is healthy, which is what you're asking, uh, uh, suggesting, and I agree. Mm -hmm. And a final bid from the gentleman at the back. Thank you, Dr Sorry. Berg, and uh, very interesting. Um, one of the more interesting presentations I've heard on this. Just a comment, though. The power of the parliament is considerable when you think about the budget processes. And if you're a prime minister or a defence minister and you have the meeting of the National Security of Cabinet and the prime minister asks the obvious question that we have a crisis, we have a request, we have a, an issue, mm -hmm. what options do we have? So people will look at the cupboard and see what the parliament has provided in terms of capability uh, and in terms of ability to actually tackle something. So the, uh, the scrutiny of the budget process and the strategic directions of the budget become critical. So one would, for example, say that if Parliament didn't provide the money for a dozen submarines, what would the options be in 10, 15 years' time if we can't deploy submarines because we don't have any? So my suggestion is that everything you've said is perfectly right, mm -hmm. but it goes much deeper and outside the typical uh, security, National Security Committee uh, environments and the national security questions because it goes right back to the resourcing issues which Parliament is well and truly in control of. That was just a... Uh... Um, I feel like Tony Jones, I'll take it as comment, but comment? <laughs> um, I suppose one reaction, and, I, and I'll type my comment back to the, to, to the previous question. Um, I think one healthy debate that Australia had recently um, was the, in the parliament, uh, was about the adequacy of defence spending and, um, you know, whether we should aim for 2% and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, there was one recent defence uh, white paper that promised a lot and then within two weeks um, the, mo the money wasn't there. Uh, and that prompted a lot of parliamentary discussion about the, the adequacy of, of uh, defence budgets, which goes to your resourcing. Question. So again, tying it to the previous question, have we got too much consensus? Um, I think y your example of, well, on resources, are we adequately resourcing our military, our policing agencies, our intelligence agencies? I think that's a debate that often doesn't get, uh, you know, heard, heard too much in the parliament. So I, I, I think I'm supporting your point about the politics of resource allocation. That is an important area where there should be you know, debate and scrutiny. Mm. So could you join me in thanking Dr Bergen? I think it was a really interesting talk. It traversed all of the intersections between national security and parliamentary processes. I'm feeling we were 
for, for my benefit, I'd have liked another 45 minutes to go down into a few of those things, but um, I think it's really done the paper justice, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.